Let's, uh, let's pray for just a moment as we begin. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just ask Jesus to speak to your life? This message will do little to no good if you are not receptive and saying, Lord, meet the need of my life. And so I hope that today the desire of your heart is to take the Word of God and allow it to speak to you. Father, bless our time together. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Somewhere, at some place, everyone comes to this same crossroad in life where they say to themselves, is this it? Is this all there is to life? Is this my purpose in life? Is this the meaning to life? I'm going to start a series next week out of Ecclesiastes and I'm going to entitle it, What is the Meaning of Life? One of the things I love about God's Word is that God teaches us that He has a purpose for everything that He created in the world. He has a purpose for every plant and rock and animal and star. He has a purpose for all of His creation. Now there's some things that He created that I'm going to have to ask Him about when I get to heaven. Like I, I don't understand why He created things that go bzzz and sting you. I, I, I don't. I don't like those guys, but <clears throat> God has a purpose for all of those things. And, uh, and if your heart is beating this morning, God has a purpose for your life. So if you want to know your purpose in life, it starts with God. The culture says in our world today, if you want to know your purpose, just look within. Ask your heart. And find out what makes you happy and what you want to do to bring you joy and, and uh, in enjoyment and follow your heart. That is your purpose. And I want to prove to you from the Bible that that is the quickest way to find depression uh, from our series next Sunday. And so I want you to know that if you follow your heart, you're going to end up with a lot of pain eventually in life. God said... I made you, and as a result of being the, the author of your life, I know the purpose behind your life. And today, we're going to look at what God says is the purpose of life, and uh, I can summarize it in one statement. You are made by God and for God, and until you understand that, life doesn't make sense. You are made for and by God, Till you understand that, life just doesn't make sense. Now, um, we could just pray and go home, right? And, um, but I, I want to share with you something else. Uh, Colossians 1.16 says, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Watch this. All things were created through Him and for for him. So everything that God does in life has a purpose. Today, um, if uh, um, someone asked you what is the purpose of life, you could tell them really that life is preparation for eternity. Uh, life is a warm up, it's a dress rehearsal, it is preschool kindergarten for eternity with God. Everything in this world will end except you. You are going to be eternal. You're going to live eternally in one of two places based on one decision you make in life. And so God wants you to know He has a purpose for your life. And today, before we start our series, I just want to take and share with you an overview of what we teach all the time, and that is God's five purposes for life. So, first of all, God said, I planned you for His pleasure. He planned us. He uh, created us for His pleasure. The Bible describes that God is a God of joy. He's not mad. He's not up in heaven looking to beat somebody. The Bible says He is a joyful God and that heaven is filled with joy. Uh, here's a verse that describes that. 
Revelation 4, 11 says, You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. So what we see in creation, all of it was because of God's good pleasure, and he created us for his pleasure. Remember this, God takes pleasure in people. If you and I are sinful people and we take pleasure in our children and in our grandchildren, and uh, um, if you haven't had grandchildren, uh, it's one of the great blessings of life. And uh, Michelle just had her first granddaughter. And, um, excuse me, uh, grandson. <clears throat> what can I say? <laughs> but... Uh, I, I want you to know <clears throat> it's a blessing to be able to have children. You ever walk in when your children are young when they're sleeping and they just look so innocent and you just look at them and realize that they're a gift that God's given to you and, uh, and you just pray over them? You know that sometimes people, a lot of maybe you, think that the only time that God's happy with you is when you're serving the Lord. Like when you're at church, then God's happy. Or when you're doing something for the Lord, then God's happy. I, that's not true. God loves you, and He's happy with who you are. So God wants us to know that He created us for His pleasure, and one of the things that should have an impact in our life is the fact that God is a God whose character is, the essence of it is love. Now, this may seem uh, pretty basic, but the Bible says that God is love, that God is not just shows love, but His essence of His character is love. Uh, the basic scripture we use for that, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave. And uh, God wants us to know that when you get a hold of that truth, I mean, when it sinks into your heart, when it speaks to your soul, and you realize that the God of heaven who created this world knows you, knows everything about you, the Bible tries to describe that by saying God knows every hair on your head. God knows every detail about your life. And he says, I love you. When you know that, it changes how you feel about yourself. It is a fact that when important people, um, when you know important people, and when they especially call you out and spend time with you, it just makes you feel a little bit more special. I mean, if the President of the United States, Donald Trump, or if you don't like him, if past President Obama, if they called you and said, hey, I just want you to come to the White House and and hang out with me for the day. Would you be willing to do that? I'd say, sure. I can arrange my schedule to do that. It would be an honor. People would go, hey, why are they calling you? Why did he call you? It would, kind of, it would just make you feel pretty special. I want you to know something. Jesus doesn't want to hang out with you for a day. He wants to hang out with you for eternity. And so God wants you to know that he loves you his plan for you doesn't just end with this life. It just really, this is the beginning. And so God has a wonderful plan for our life. And um, because of that, he wants us to learn to love him. And so the Bible says the greatest commandment that God gave us is found in Matthew 22. When a lawyer asked Jesus, what's the most important commandment? He's speaking of the Old Testament. And Jesus a quote out of Deuteronomy, and he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, this is the first and greatest commandment. So God, because he created us for his pleasure, uh, our purpose is to know him and to love him. So exactly how do you do that? How does a person love God? Well, men, <clears throat> how does your wife want you to demonstrate love to her? Now, if you're thinking sex right now, I, you need a counseling appointment. <laughs> and um, that's how you think. That's not how she thinks. And women want you to spend time with them, talking to them, 
Just you and her. Not you and her in the football game, but you and her. And so uh, I want you to know, if you don't learn that, you won't get the other thing either. <laughs> and so uh, God wants us to understand that fellowship is something he created us for. And God wants us to understand that he made us to hang out with him. So God wants us to know that it's not achievements in this world. Doesn't matter what your sales are, what your rewards in the public are, uh, how uh, high you uh, get in the corporate world. Uh, to know God is the purpose every day to know Him a little better. You know the tragedy is that most people spend their entire life never knowing Him. Some people earn a PhD. Uh, some people have uh, expertise in athletics and entertainment. Uh, they speak five languages, brilliant people, but they would not know one thing about spiritual truth. They don't know one thing about the Bible. I want you to know, if you don't know Jesus personally, you have missed the purpose of life. And so I hope that you'll pray for people that you know who are missing their purpose. Well, how do you know if you're not connected to Jesus? This morning, you're sitting there, and you're asking yourself, I mean, how do I know I'm connected? How do you know? Well, God built in a warning light in our life. That if you're not connected to Jesus, there's a warning light that goes off. And it's called stress. And when your life is filled with stress, you're saying, I have to control everything. I have to act like God. I have to be uh, the manager of the universe i have to be the one in charge uh, the bible says in matthew 6 that people who don't know god are characterized by worry because they don't have anybody else to help them they think they're alone so it's if it's going to happen it's up to me and so they spend all their life trying to get ahead and trying to fill the hole that god placed in their heart there's an empty place in people's lives, and they spend all their life trying to find something that will satisfy that. And if it's not this relationship, then it'll be another relationship. If it's not this job, maybe it's another job. And they just keep looking for pleasure. And it doesn't matter how much sex, how much stuff, how much uh, status, doesn't matter how much you put in there, uh, th there's always this temporary, oh, that's it, and then... It, won't be long and you'll be right back to the place where you go this is not it i'm just as empty as i was before it's because there's only one thing that can fill that hole that's jesus man and so god wants you to know you need him and um so the first purpose in life is to understand god made you for his pleasure and then for you to know and to love god here's the second one god fashioned me for his family the bible teaches that God never meant for you to go it alone. You know, though, I think the scripture would verify the statement that God hates loneliness. You know, after he created everything in the world, and he said it was good, 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 everything was good. In 2.18 of Genesis, he says for the very first time, something's not good. He said it was not good for man to be alone. Now, um, that's true. Men don't do good alone. And, uh, but marrying somebody, although that solves the loneliness problem, it doesn't solve it if there's not relationship going on, right? I mean, two people can live in the same house and be really alone. Matter of fact, it's even worse. And so God wants us to know that He didn't make us to be a part, uh, to, uh, to suffer through loneliness. When you're born physically, you're born into the human race. And the Bible says that God wants you to choose. It's a choice to be a part of God's family. And uh, you're not born into God's family automatically. That's a choice that you make. Here's a verse. <clears throat> In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, All honor to God, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, for it is His boundless mercy that has given us the privilege of being born again so that we are now members 
of God's own family. So the Bible says that <clears throat> salvation is a choice that we make. And we choose to say, I no longer just want to be a part of the human family, I want to be a part of God's family. And it means that I get a fresh start. It means that no matter what I've done in the past, how many times I've messed up, all my um, guilt and shame and tragedies of, of the past, I can say to God, forgive me. God says, I do forgive you. And you can be born again and have a new life, new start. And so God wants us to know that today, if you're here and you're not sure you're born again, this would be a great day to, to ask Jesus to come into your life and say yes to him. Uh, by the way, we believe at this church that God died for everyone and that anyone and everyone can be saved if they choose to. What exactly is God's family? Uh, when you say God's family, what do you mean? When you say, I want to be born again, what does it mean to be in God's family? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, then even if I delay, you will know how to live in the family of God. What's the family of God? That family is the church of the living God, the support and foundation of the truth. So the Bible says the family of God is right here, the church. The ecclesia is what comes together, and when we come together, we are acting or functioning as the body of uh, of Christ the church and so God wants us to know that the church is the foundation and support of truth it is not as some people say just a nonprofit organization although it is it's not uh, surely not just an institution or a foundation of some sort a, 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 bureauc a bureaucracy or a, an organization some people say it's a social club it's not that the Bible says it's a family that's why one of the things we try to do here is treat people like family and to encourage people like family. So why is the church important? You see those two words, the support and foundation of the truth? Everyone knows what a foundation looks like. Although we don't walk up to someone's new home, uh, the Bilardis are building a new home, and when we walk up to their home, we don't go, wow, man, what a cool foundation. That's not what we look at, but we know that apart from a good foundation, you can't have a church. You can't have a home. And then that foundation, there are structures, support beams that hold everything up. God says the church is the foundation and the support beams for this, the truth. So it's up to the church to get this to the world and to do it in a way that they can understand it. It is our responsibility, the church, to support and hold up the truth of God's Word. So God says that if your, church, if your life is going to um, stay strong during earthquakes, when earthquakes hit your personal life, your financial life, your health, your emotional life, your marriage, when earthquakes hit your life, if you don't have a support system, you're going to collapse. And so God wants you to know you're not to go it alone. You're to be holding up each other. The church is designed to encourage one another, to love one another. That's why we have uh, life groups. And um, life groups are where we meet during the week and get together in small groups. Fellowship, get connected, uh, pray together, have a small Bible study and I hope that you'll take it this year and make it your purpose to get involved in a life group. We're going to start a celebration lunch every six weeks or every two months uh, and uh, celebration dinner, excuse me. And we're going to do that on a Wednesday night and we're not going to have life groups that week. We're going to ask everybody to come together on a Wednesday evening and we'll have a, a light dinner here and just have a time of fellowship. And so we're going to do that in order for people just to be able to hang out and get to know each other a little bit more. So <clears throat> church is important because it is a place that you can get support. So the first purpose in life is to learn to love God. The second is to learn to love other people in the church. I hear people say all the time, don't you? I don't need the church. 
I worship God when I go out into nature. And we have beautiful nature here. And, uh, well, sure you can worship God in nature. God created nature. But you cannot uh, do what the Bible says God wants us to do. That is to love other people when you're out by yourself in nature. That's a selfish act, really. Although you can go out and worship God out there, God meant for us to be a part of the church. God wants us to learn to love people. Now, not just ideal people. You know that? All of us like loving people, but they have to fit into our category. And uh, we call them ideal people. People who are cool, like you. People that are smart, like you. People who think like you think. Ideal people. The problem is, God puts different people in the church. And sometimes they're what we call heavenly sandpaper. And God puts them in the church so that you can learn to love people that are just not like you. And uh, we call them EGRs. Extra grace required. And, uh, and so... Uh, yeah, yeah, how many of you are sitting next to some? No, uh, no. <laughs> and uh, so God wants us to know that he wants us to learn to love people. And that means joining hands and holding hands with people because we have a great purpose. And our purpose is so great. We need to overlook the things that divide us and join hands for the purpose of uh, of reaching this lost uh, city we live in. So, God created us for His pleasure. He fashioned us for His family. Here's a third reason. God created me to, because He wants me to become like Christ. Now, I want to kind of unpack this a little bit. One of the reasons Jesus came to the earth was that He came here to demonstrate what spirituality looks like to what mature Christians look, should live like. He came here and lived a perfect life. He, uh, he, he went to the cross and died for us on the cross. But he came here also to show us, here is what the model is. Follow this model. Now, so what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to be like Jesus? Well, Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Now, how are you transformed? By the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. So God gave us an incredible organ, the mind. Everybody has seen a, a mind uh, on TV or in science classes, and you go, how in the world does that organ that looks really funny, how, how in the world does that work? to do all that we do and, and have all the ability. It's amazing. The mind has incredible potential. And God wants you to have a mind that dreams great things and does great things and can do the impossible for other people in this world. A mind that's centered on absolute truth can be objective it can have the ability to reason, to look at other people's worldview and understand. God wants us to be people who love knowledge. You know that? Some of you need to turn the TV off and do more reading and more listening to maybe speakers who are sharing about knowledge. And um, God wants you to make 2018 the year that you increase your knowledge of God's Word. Matter of fact, he says in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. And he goes on to say, there's consequences coming. Now, you'll note in that verse, he does not say, my people are destroyed from lack of faith. He didn't say that. He said, it's worse than that. It's much worse than that. 
He said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Your faith is based upon your knowledge of God's Word. And so God said, if you're not learning, if you're not growing, if you're not committed to getting more into your mind and understanding more truth, you're not fulfilling God's purpose for your life. So, um, I have always believed that Jesus is the smartest man in the world. He's smarter, and, uh, and the, the depth of his teachings are deeper, and more wisdom, more insight than any and all of the philosophers of the world, Freud, and Marx, and Plato, and anybody else together. So how in the world can we begin letting God develop our minds and have wisdom? Wisdom is based upon knowledge. Wisdom is taking the knowledge of God and applying it to my life. And so how can I do that? If I was going to say to you, you know, it is our responsibility to develop the character of God, to know the character of God and let that character become our life and to transform our minds. Where would we find a list of character qualities in the Bible where we could say that is what Jesus looked like and that's, how, that's my goal. I'm, I'm working toward developing those character qualities. Well, it's found in um, Galatians chapter 6. Uh, let me go back before we get there. In Philippians chapter 2, God wants us to know, here's how we get to this place. Um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 5. It says this, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Now, if you would just apply that verse to your marriage, your marriage is going to get better. If you decide that I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to out-love you, God says, I want you to know, that is what we should do in life. If you've got teenagers, more than one at home, you should have them memorize verse 3. And then it goes on to say, Let each of you look not uh, out not for his own interest. That's what we do all the time, right? But also for the interests of others. And let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So God wants us to have the mind of Christ. He wants us to think like he does because he wants to develop our life upon these characteristics in uh, Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 gives us the fruit of the spirit love joy peace patience gentleness goodness faithfulness meekness self-control now all of us could take this list every day in our prayer life we could look at this and say which one of those <clears throat> should I really be asking God to help me with because there's one of those that are really glaringly needed more in your life. And uh, so God wants us to develop his character quality. And it's this. So how does God teach you these character qualities? Every parent here knows how this works, right? Because it is your job to teach your kids the character of Jesus. And you do it, right? By, they just wake up every morning and you see the love of Jesus developed in their life. They just wake up and they love more. They have more joy. They have more peace for their siblings. And they, it's amazing. Every day they just have a little bit more. Does, does that, is that true? No. If you don't teach them how to demonstrate love and joy and peace, they're not going to automatically get this. So... It's your job to teach your children the character qualities of Christ. So how does God teach you the character qualities? He puts you in exactly the opposite situation of these character qualities. He says, you know, some of you need to have a little bit more Jesus love in your life. And so what does he do? He brings some heavenly sandpaper into your life. He brings some EGRs into your life and says, why don't you, you know, get away from just you and what you want, what you think, and why don't you reach out and help somebody else and love somebody else? God does the same thing with joy. By the way, joy is not happiness. Joy comes when I recognize that in the midst of circumstances, uh, I can have His joy in my life by simply looking to Him and saying, God, I know you're in control. 
And God gives me his joy. God gives me his peace. Patience. Just go visit the motor vehicle department. <laughs> go visit the doctor's office and you have to sit there for an hour. Uh, go to Costco and get in line on Friday afternoon. And uh, it's always, you know, it's always a contest when you, when you pull up and you got your bag and you're looking, trying to find the line. And, and every time I choose the line, it's all, I look and I see, I watch people that I could be behind. And they, oh, they, I always pick the wrong line. And I think God is saying, I want you to slow down. It's not that important. Have some patience. And um, you say, should I pay, pray for patience? No. Uh, God will always answer that prayer. And uh, so um, God wants to develop our life. And he wants to teach us the character of his life in our life because he has a plan for our life. So how long does it take to get the, 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 the character of Christ in your life? Well, the Bible says it takes this long. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. So all of us, who have had that veil removed, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. Once you get saved, you begin to see things differently. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, watch this, makes us more and more. That means little by little, little by little. God is patient, and He just wants you to improve a little. And just take another step toward the Lord. Take another step. He doesn't transform our lives overnight. You say, again, how long does it take? <clears throat> more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. So as long as you have breath, God's in the process of changing you. And uh, so God wants us to know they had a purpose for our life. It is to know and love God. It is to come to the place where we are a part of the family and we are learning to love people. Then God said, I created you so that you can have the mind of Christ, so that you can think like him and act like him. But there's a fourth purpose, and that is for you to learn to serve him. In the Psalms 139 and verse 13 14, it says, you made my whole being. You formed me in my mother's body. I praise you because you made me in an amazing and wonderful way. What you have done is wonderful. I know this very well. Someone said, you're one in a million. No, no. You're one in, I think it's 7.1 seven, 7 .1 billion people in the world. God made you unique. No one else has your DNA. And God wants you to know that I have made you for a purpose. And one of the purposes is to learn to serve Him. By the way, that is why we believe that abortion is wrong it is a sin because the bible says that god creates life there may be accidental parents there are no accidental births uh, there may be illegitimate parents no illegitimate children because life is given by god and and i don't care what your parents were like they may have been good they may have been bad they may have been terrible they may have been really terrible they may have ab uh, abandoned you. It doesn't matter. God used their DNA to make you because He wanted you. And God wants to use your life in a wonderful way. So God wants us to know that He has a plan and a purpose for our life. Now, here's how to discover that. In 301 class that starts the first Sunday in February at 9 o'clock, um, we're going to share with you the five things that God uses to shape your life. And God uses your spiritual gifts and your emotions and experiences. God uses all those things to bring about you. And so if you want to discover how God shaped you and where He wants to use you, you ought to sign up. We can, there's only 20 people that can sign up for the class because of the room. And so I hope that you'll take advantage of that. So there's no direct way. I can't go right directly to God because He is in heaven and I'm here. I can't go directly to Him and serve Him. So what's the best way then to serve God? God said, you serve me by serving other people. And when we do that, we serve Him. Watch. 
In Matthew 25, 31 through 40, it says this, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the people will say, uh, the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Watch. And the king will answer and say to them, or Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you have done it to the one of the least of these my brethren, you've done it to me. So Jesus said, when you reach out to help somebody else and minister to somebody else, you are ministering to him. Especially, is that true, in the household of God. And so God wants us to know the way in which we can serve the Lord is by serving one another. Now, uh, there's a lot of different ways to serve the Lord. In the bulletin, uh, there was an insert. And uh, would you just look at that for a second? In the... Uh, in this insert, it says, <clears throat> I'm ready to take the next step. Some of you <clears throat> uh, are not actively serving in some capacity. And uh, all of us, there are certain things here on this list that we can get involved in. So you can get involved in some area of ministry. Um, we have a 1030 service. That means we need greeters out there at uh, 10 after. And so... Um, we have a, a lot of greeters signed up for the 9 o'clock, but you that are coming to the 1030 service, some of you can be greeters at that service. And uh, where is uh, Judy? Right here. Oh, stand up, Judy. So Judy oversees our greeters ministry. And uh, some of you weren't able to come to the meeting last week, but you could sign up and be a part of the greeters ministry and en enjoy greeting people as they come in. So you can talk to her, sign an in-touch card, put it uh, out there or give it to her, and get on the list, the rotation list. Um, why are we only having children's ministry at 1030? Because we do not have a team of people to do children's ministry at 9 o'clock. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had another Amber and another Liz and another, uh, other people that work in there, another team that was willing to come and serve and do that at 9 o'clock so they can come to church, and then they'll do that at 10.30 and you can come to church. That's the reason we don't have children's ministry going on both hours. Now, um, Carrier said he, he would be willing to help uh, even lead that team but he needs some people to help him uh, make that happen so I, I want you to know there are places that you can serve the Lord by certain what, what better ministry than the serving little children and teaching them how much God loves them same thing with all these other areas where there's ushers and ministry and music and discipleship there's the classes that are coming up and uh, so you can fill that out and uh and hand it in today, and somebody will get in touch with you about that. So, <clears throat> um, here's the last thing, real quickly. God designed me for a mission. Jesus came into the world, and he fulfilled his mission. And the Bible says, without a vision, there peop the people perish, in Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. That's true, not only of your life personally, but it's true of a business without a purpose, without a clear mission, without a clear vision. It's true of your family, your marriage. If there's not a clear direction that you're headed on purpose, uh, things begin to fall apart. And God wants you to exchange your plan for his plan. And the reason people have so many problems so often in life is because they just won't give in to God's plan for their life. God has a plan for your life. I can promise you it is easier than your plan. It's less frustrating. There's less headaches if you do it God's way. Doesn't mean it's easy. Just means it's a lot easier. So God wants you to give Him your life. You say, well, you know, I'm living a pretty good life right now. 
Matter of fact, I think I'm living the good life. And you know something? You are. If you live in America, Montana, and especially Missoula, Montana, you are living the good life. There are, when I go down to Southern California and we wear Montana t-shirts down there, people go, oh, oh, I've always wanted to live in Montana. And, uh, and when people, thousands of people come up here and visit during the summer, I always say, you know, the weather's like this all year. <laughs> Just come on. And, um, but um, we live in a coveted place. You are living the good life. Most of you have good jobs, good health, good family, good stuff. So what, why would I want to exchange my life, my plan, for God's? Because God's better. I mean, you may have a good life, but wouldn't you want a better life than a good life? Sure. And the better life is not religion. Better life is a life with Jesus. And so God wants us to have a good life. You say, can I have the good life or the better life with Jesus if I have doubts? Listen very carefully and I'm done. A lot of people come to the edge of salvation and they understand Jesus died for them and loves them and wants them to be saved and is, he's knocking on your heart saying, would you please let me come into your life? And they say, well, I've got doubts. And uh, I've, got, I've got some questions. Can you invite Jesus into your heart and still have questions? Yeah. Uh, I have questions about the chemistry of digestion. <laughs> I don't understand how I eat wonderful Mexican food and it just makes me feel good. I, I don't understand that, but it doesn't stop me from eating. I don't understand how... Uh, an engine, car engine works, combustion. I, I really, I don't know. But I, I like driving a car. I, I don't understand how cell phones work, how uh, the internet works. I still enjoy that, even though I have questions about it. I want you to know something. You can invite Jesus in your life, even if you have questions. He will answer every question. If you'll take that first step. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. <clears throat> There's not a better time to begin the year than to begin it with Jesus in your heart. And so this morning, I hope that you'll say, I want to have the Lord in my life. Some of you are Christians, most of you are here are Christians and and uh, you've been serving the Lord your way and doing it your way. And God is saying to you this morning, would you, would you give me your life? Would you surrender your life to me and let me be first? I wonder if you're here this morning and you say, you know, Pastor, I have invited Jesus into my life and... Uh, I ha ask Him to come into my heart and He is my Savior and I know that. Would you raise your hand and say, I, I, that's a testimony, I know I'm saved today. Raise your hand if you know you're a Christian. Amen, good. So <clears throat> if you're here and, and maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you would say, you know, I want to invite Christ into my life. Would you, would you just pray a simple prayer with me? Salvation is this simple. If you'll pray this simple prayer and ask Jesus to come into your life, he'll come in and change your heart. So here's the prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I cannot save myself. I ask Jesus to come into my life and save me and forgive me of all my sin. I give you my life and my will in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed and asked Jesus to come into your life this morning, would you raise your hand and say, yeah, I did, I did pray that. God bless you. Someone else. Yes. Yes. After the service, I want you to come up 
to where the cross is at. And we have people here that will just want to pray with you and say, thank you for making that decision. And we'll celebrate with you. If you're here as a believer and you know that you need to really make some changes in your life and you just want someone to pray with you, there are people here that will pray with you. So I hope that you'll come up during the service, uh, right after the service. And then one other thing. Ten minutes after we're finished, we will have our annual business meeting. We do this once a year. We will give you a copy of the budget. And we will be voting on our new uh, leaders to come on the board. We'd like for you to stay. And so give me 10 minutes to shake hands and then we'll start that meeting. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed, eyes closed. And